Hi everyone, Zoe Terrific here, and welcome back to another to camera video. The 3rd of January 2020, trying to do these weekly. Falling a little behind, but only a day behind, so I've got this. I will catch up. Anyway, um, this being a Wednesday, my goal is to hopefully get this recorded, edited, and released before midnight. Might be pushing it, only a few hours away. But any rate, um, I'm trying to start the, um, the Writing Wednesdays periodic feature, so hopefully future writing-themed uh, videos will come out on Wednesdays. Not necessarily every Wednesday, but we'll see what I can manage. So for this inaugural episode, I'm calling it Learning the Lingo, uh, 12 Useful Terms for Character Writing. And this is going to be a grab bag, so there should be terms here that you're already familiar with, and then there should be ones, hopefully, that you've never heard of before, so you can learn something new. And if not, at least, you know, it's a video with me, so bonus. So anyway, without further ado, I actually have a notepad with notes on it. Shocking. So organized. So at least I shouldn't go too far off the rails this time. It shouldn't be a half hour video. So let's get started. The first term I'd like to introduce is something called the author insert. And okay, this is basically where the author, kind of is what it sounds like, has written themselves into their story. In some cases, it's like they've given themselves the lead role, the protagonist, and um, their character is basically doing all the things and spouting all the rhetoric and basically using, you know, they're using that character as a mouthpiece for their philosophy or their politics or what have you. Or it can be, you know, more innocuous than that. But um, some classic examples of this would be like um character of, um, is it Randolph Carter from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft? That's basically H.P. Lovecraft putting himself into his stories. Um, what would be another one? Um, oh, um, Kurt Vonnegut uh, wrote himself into Slaughterhouse Five as the character of Billy Pilgrim. It's a, a lot of that is autobiographical. So these are examples of author inserts, and you can see that they're not always bad. It doesn't have to be the case. It's like, what are you doing? You can't just write yourself into your own story. I mean, there's the understanding that obviously, as authors, we are going to draw upon bits of our own character, bits of our memories, experiences, to try to write characters. So there's going to be a little bit of us in all of our characters, but it's just when you basically wholesale, just implant yourself in the story, usually as the hero, that um, that you've probably gone a bit over the line with the author insert. So let's move on to our second term, which is, oh yes, if you take this too far, I've tried to organize these in a sensible order, um, you end up with something called the Mary Sue. Now this term derives actually originally from a 1974 fanfic. It was for, from the Star Trek universe. I think it was called um, A Trekkie's Tale or Trekker's Tale. I, I guess it was Trekkie because this would have been the 70s before Trekker became the preferred term. So yeah, A Trekkie's Tale, in which case there is actually a character named Mary Sue, which is this, um, the Mary Sue is basically a character that is perfect in almost every way and um, can do no wrong, or if they do wrong, it's not someone else's fault, really. And they're just gorgeous, and everybody loves them, and they, they're really good at most of the things they do, and they're pretty if they're a girl, thus the Mary Sue. You can also have Marty Stews, so this actually works if you have like a male characters who are perfect in every way, rather unreasonably and without any character flaws or any reason why you'd actually want to explore the development of the character. It's just, they're just there to do everything right and have hopefully all the other characters and maybe the readership admire them it doesn't always pan out that way usually mary sues are reviled by um the reading audience because they're recognized immediately as sort of a flat character archetype so anyway um this isn't to be confused with another term which i'm going to include called the peggy sue so the peggy sue doesn't have to be this perfect character the peggy sue actually is the um it derives from the film Peggy Sue Got Married, which I believe was 1986, Kathleen Turner um, playing the lead role or the eponymous role. And this is a character who has a chance, usually towards the end or in the latter part of the um, of the story, or in this case, the film, to kind of rewind time, go back in time, having the knowledge of everything that's happened beforehand and kind of do things differently. So that's a Peggy Sue character. Um, there's other variations on this, but I'm trying to stick to my notes. So let's go on to the next one before I get too distracted. Um, right, another character type that you might see, um, and definitely in the case of mysteries, especially a lot of CSI episodes fall into this type, but also things like, you know, Hercule Poirot and, um, you know, Marple Mysteries, this sort of thing from Agatha Christie. You will have a character which we refer to as the, um, the Chekhov's gunman. Now this is obviously a play off the phrase Chekhov's gun, which I will introduce in another video, but it's basically if there's something that seems prominently priced early on in the, um, 
in the other uh, writing or the TV show or whatever, and then isn't mentioned much for a while, it may actually play an important role later on. And in the case of Chekhov's gunman, we're dealing with a character who doesn't seem to necessarily be there for any other reason. Basically, everybody else has a purpose in the plot and they're actively pursuing things or they're being pursued or they're being investigated in the case of a detective or police procedural. And then there's this other character who's just kind of like thrown in there early on and then, yeah, it doesn't seem to be mentioned. And at the very end of the mystery or the detective episode, turns out they did it. What a shock, huh? Um, I guess a an example, I don't want to give actually too many examples of this because they're obviously very spoilery, but um, I can think of examples in like um, Noel Coward's Blythe Spirit, there's an example of this. What would another one be like, um, oh, Tom Stoppard's The Real Inspector Hound. So I won't say who turns out to be a Chekhov's gunman in these, but these are places you can go up and look at very obvious examples of like how this plays out. So yeah, if you see somebody who doesn't seem to be there for any other reason except possibly to advance the plot, be very suspicious of what they may be up to. So if you um, go to the opposite extreme, rather than having someone you kind of snuck in who may be important later, the Chekhov's gunman, we obviously verge towards something called um, the Chosen One, and this hopefully everybody's heard this term. In some cases, it's actually literally how the character is referred to in the fiction. I mean, um, famous examples would be like, well, Frodo Baggins, Bilbo Baggins, even Aragorn from The Lord of the Rings. These are all characters who just seems that they had to do, they had to fill that one role, and this whole story is going to revolve around them. In the case of the Hobbits, it's having that ring for a certain amount of time and bearing it for a certain period and then having to either hand it over or get it all the way to Mount Doom. Spoilers, God, if you haven't read Lord of the Rings yet, um, get on it. But um, there are other more recent examples like um, Katniss Everdeen from uh, The Hunger Games. It's definitely a chosen one character. It's like only she can turn the fate of the, um, of the nation around, uh, lead this sort of revolution, or at least inspire it. Um, oh yeah, obviously, the one I was saying earlier, you might see ones where the, the character is literally referred to as the Chosen One. Harry Potter, obviously the prime example, literally referred to as the Chosen One throughout the series. So yeah, um, generally speaking, you'd like to at least not, you know, uh, not make that quite as flagrant in your writing. So you might have chosen a character as your kind of the chosen one in which, around which all the plot is going to revolve and kind of magnetically be attracted to this this one character, but maybe don't make it so it's quite so obvious that's like, well, it has nothing to do with them. It just They started from a humble beginning, but they are destined to be the one to save the entire universe. That's a little hackneyed. So, um, naturally, if you have a chosen one character, this kind of like uber important character, usually um, they have some sort of fatal flaw or something the audience is aware of and concerned that might scupper their ability to carry out this um this destiny and that is called um usually the achilles heel so obviously this kind of goes back to well the, the mythology of greece and so you have the achilles involved in the trojan war and um spoilers <laughs> was uh, shot by paris i believe uh by, with an arrow and just in case you're not familiar with the mythology uh when achilles was a baby um, his mother like dipped him, I believe, in this. I can't remember what the exact story is. I probably should have researched this before actually starting to record. But dipped him in this kind of like elixir that protects his whole body. But had, she had to hold him by something, so she held him by the heel. And so the heel did not get dipped because I guess her fingers couldn't touch the, the magical protective elixir. So yeah, he grew up and like nothing could harm him except if somebody shot him in the heel, as turns out Paris did. So that's the literal origin of the Achilles heel, but more familiarly, you might see it like in, um, obviously superhero tropes abound for this. Uh, Superman has kryptonite, so that's definitely Superman's um, Achilles heel, and of course Lex Luthor is very aware of this, and so you can see this recur throughout much of that, um, much of that whole run of fiction. So yeah, um, now we've kind of gone through like one run of what you can do with these characters. Sorry, my voice is going as it always does when I record these. So let's see, you have your chosen one, they have their Achilles heel, maybe they succeed in their destiny or they don't, but what another thing that can happen is you can pull in characters who aren't your hero, um, 
who may, may be anti-heroes or may just be kind of people who seem at the start like they're baddies. And then you can kind of surprise the reader by saying, actually, you know, they're, they're not that bad or they've decided to join the heroes and help out or something like this. And this the technical term for this is called a heel face turn. So now the terms heel and face derive from professional wrestling. So a heel is somebody who, well, acts like a heel. So kind of a baddie, he's always like, poor sportsmanship, um, maybe like getting into arguments with like um, the refs and stuff like this, um, generally being a nuisance, someone that the um, the audience is supposed to like not be cheering for, basically they're supposed to hate on that one. And then the face is obviously, you know, a good person in pro wrestling, so it's one of these kind of people that everyone's supposed to be cheering for, and so the face defeats the heel usually, this sort of thing. So yeah, if you make a heel face turn, you're basically going from someone that is basically, hmm, not a very nice person to someone who's actually all right. So you see a bit of this, um, I guess a good example in comics, sorry, I'm thinking a lot of comics because my wife's into comics. Um, a lot of the original, the original baddies that Flash Gordon has to sort out, um, he manages to convince them to get on side. So a lot of these people that seem very antagonistic at the beginning, then suddenly kind of come around and turn out to be not so bad after all and willing to help out Flash Gordon once they see the light. Um, and obviously there's the opposite of this, which is, this is a bit trickier and also less common, which is the, um, which is the face heel turn. So in this case, you're looking at someone who, in the early part of the fiction, whether it's a TV show or a film or a book or a novel or something, um, They've been presented to the audience as a good person, doing good things or motivated well, and at some point something happens to cause them to turn to the dark side, as it were. Um, and so yeah, they actually make this possibly a terrible choice or a terrible series of choices, and they become an evil character. And uh, there are various ways of doing this, obviously, I'm not going to go into all of them. But yeah, these are kind of two terms that you might hear, and so that's, that's what that's all about. So let's see, um, if you want to set someone up not necessarily as a baddie, not do one of these massive contrasts like heel face turn or face heel turns, but you want to set someone up as a um, as someone to make choices that are different to say your protagonists um, and you just want to show up the character strengths or even the character weaknesses of your protagonist, you can have a character called a foil and all this is is somebody who, yeah, basically who, when placed in parallel situations or analogous scenarios in your work of fiction, makes choices that are very different from the choices that the, the protagonist or your hero makes. Um, a good example of this would be Draco Malfoy from, again, the Harry Potter series, because Draco, when faced with choices of, like, ethical dilemmas, um, tends to make poor choices, where Harry Potter, um, seems to somehow come through despite his anger as used at times, seems to make the right choice in the end. So yeah, uh, Draco Malfoy would be a foil to Harry Potter. Let's see, I've got only a couple more to go. Okay, so now, um, so you, we've kind of gone through like character archetypes and character changes. Let's start examining some of the, the character changes, the things you can do to an established character that might not be so good. Um, one of these is a uh, flanderization. So now this is a funny sounding term. This goes back to um, the character of Ned Flanders from the Simpsons TV series. And basically flanderization is just when, when you had a character who had a quirk or several quirks and was an interesting kind of normal, reasonable character. And for whatever reason, in the case of TV, it's very easy to start saying, oh, that quirk is fun. Let's get that quirk back. And then you begin to exaggerate the quirks until the quirks become the entire character. And so in the case of Ned Flanders, he went from sort of a normal kind of friendly neighbor type who was religious and kind of like progressed to this kind of caricature of himself. And that's how you know that you flanderized a character when basically all people think of as the exaggerated aspects and they don't see any, there's no more depth. It's just this one thing. And that is all the character is. So ideally, you don't want to do that. Um, there are arguments for, like in sitcoms, it might be useful um, just to keep things funny and to cause these exaggerated conflicts. But general, in, in most writing, you try to avoid flanderizing your characters. Now, there are worse things um, than flanderization. And uh, one of these, which happens a lot uh, traditionally to female characters, is damseling. So um, you've no doubt heard the expression that damsel in distress. Um, and yeah, it's far too common to take away the agency, particularly of female characters. Um, 
and basically place them just in a roll as an object or a, a goal or a prize that the, um, the male characters typically must um, rescue, achieve, win back, protect, whatever, something they'll get at the end. But the actual female character doesn't get to do a whole lot, um, doesn't get to make choices to actually perhaps get herself out of whatever situation has caused her to be damseled. So yeah, damseling is basically actively denying agency to usually a female character for the benefit of usually your male characters. But um, even that isn't the, the worst thing that can happen to uh, female characters, or indeed any characters of any gender in fiction. Um, it can go beyond that if like it, the author is not content merely to remove the agency from the female characters to give more uh, motivation to the um the male characters then yeah uh there's an effect called fridging and this is um this is in reference originally the term uh, refers to a website by gail simone called women in refrigerators and this was pointing out the um the rather worrying practice, especially in comics writing, of like saying, gosh, I really want to motivate my male hero, my usually superhero. How can I do this? What's a good dramatic thing? Oh, I know, I can have the villain kill off his girlfriend or his wife or his mother or just, you know, anyone female around and do something horrible to them and have them discover um, this horrible thing that was done to someone they cared about. Um, usually not someone given a lot of screen time prior to this because again it's just a tool for motivating the, the male hero typically. So yeah, uh, th I think the first example is this was from Green Lantern. There's a storyline where the hero's girlfriend, Alexandra DeWitt, um, the, um, I can't remember, the, like the main villain's major force or something, basically kills her, stuffs her in a refrigerator, so yeah, the hero finds her dead in a fridge. Um, Fortunately, we're seeing a lot less of this. Unfortunately, we're not seeing zero of it. There's a lot of writers, um, script writers, in many cases, who just haven't got the memo that, you know what, there are other ways of motivating your male hero uh, rather than just killing, maiming, torturing, or whatever um, their female, their love interests. So please stop doing that. So yeah, um, I've covered the 12 terms. I have no idea how long this has been. Hopefully less than the 30 minutes my last few videos have been. Hopefully this has been interesting. I will do more of these, obviously not on character terms. I'll choose maybe different types of terminology for writing and maybe discuss other things. We could talk about tropes. There's lots of tropes. Some of these are actually tropes. So um, if you enjoyed this, please do leave me a comment in the comment section because otherwise I have no idea also. Yeah, click on the like button. I mean, I. I'm trying here, so I'm trying to like make videos that appeal, and a lot of work goes into this, a lot more than a Beat Saber video. So, you know, unless you hate it, and if you hate it, just leave me a comment. Don't be impolite, but just tell me what you disliked about it. Maybe I can change future ones. But anyway, I think that's it. Thank you again for tuning in, and um, I have no idea what the next video will be. If it's on a different day of the week, it'll probably be on a different theme rather than writing. But um, but yeah, trying to keep it this one video per week minimum, and we'll see how we get on as we go through 2020. Okay, take care, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye. Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button or leave me some feedback as a comment or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help. And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.